Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Depends on when you're watching this video, but this is Chapter 25, Cold War America with your teacher, Mr. Cummings. And we're gonna dive into some Cold War slides looking at the years 1945 to 1963. So early, we're gonna look at the origins of the Cold War. So where does this conflict come from? Number one, let's define it. It's called a Cold War because we never get into an all out shooting war, a quote, hot war with the Soviet Union. Uh, but it will last a while, 1945 to 1991. That doesn't mean there aren't conflicts. Obviously, there's Korea War, Vietnam, and a whole host of other clandestine conflicts along the way. Truman is now president. FDR dies in April of 45 uh, after being elected to his fourth term. And he's pretty much kind of caught. Uh, no matter really what he does, he's going to catch some sort of criticism for it. You, you're not tough enough. You're, you're too strong. Uh, there shouldn't be a conflict. We should be friends. All these debates swirl. Uh, what have our relationships been with the Soviets up until this point? Uh, we do have a longer history of mistrust, 1917 to 39. This is the Bolsheviks with Lenin and all those guys. Uh, when they take over, first Red Scare in the United States. We don't really want that coming over here. Uh, we will be allies in World War II. Uh, the Soviet Union and Germany will sign a non-aggression pact early during the conflict and then violate that very quickly when Germany invades Russia. And that uh, will make them allies with the United States. We do give them a lend lease aid. We, we give them a ton of supplies to, to help them in the war. Working together in the conflict. And we do have some cooperative successes after the war. The, the Soviet Union does support the creation of the United Nations and, and some early UN programs. We create the UN in response to the World War II conflict. Remember, we tried to do the League of Nations at the end of World War I and that failed. So after World War II, you see a lot of things where we try to actually use history and learn from our mistakes. It's a very novel idea for humanity. And look at, well, these were the failures after World War I. Can we make changes after World War II? The Soviets also will cooperate with what are the Nuremberg trials. These are the famous uh, war crime trials for the Nazis and the Holocaust crimes. Uh, but yet they will oppose us with the creation of the International Monetary Fund and World Bank. These are initiatives the United States wants to do create a, try to create a, a, a more stable global economy, uh, things like that. And then as well as limiting nukes. So you do see some conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union as well. We have met at Yalta. This was uh, FDR towards the end of the war in 1945. The, it's pretty much the, the outcome of the war by the time Yalta uh, occurs is well known. And it's, this is now looking at what are we going to do when the war is over? So Russia, the Soviet Union wants these satellite states. These will be nations between the West and Soviet Union proper. So look at like Poland, uh, Czech, places like that uh, as kind of like a buffer zone. We'll look at a map here in a second. Uh, they also promise free elections in Poland and lie on that. And that will be a, a trigger point for the United States as well. Um, I mean, they're, they're communist Russians. Like, what do you expect them to do? Uh, it's Stalin. He lies with every breath he takes. So going forward, this is kind of crystallizing the way the world is going to look, at least in Western Europe. Here you have a picture, East meets West. You have the Soviet soldier on the right, the American soldier on the left, and you see the image standing on the, the Nazi swastika. So trying to show a bit of cooperation there. So what is the containment policy? That's what we're going to get into on this slide here. So you have containment. This is a phrase that's used by George Kennan. Uh, he coins the phrase in the policy in 1947. The idea here is we want to contain the spread of communism. We don't want it to reach new places. That does not mean we're gonna go liberate communist countries in an effort to eradicate communism. So influenced by Munich and this idea of appeasement. So the Munich conference was before World War II where very famously the British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain was making deals with the Germans. Hitler was saying, give me this and I won't ask for anything else. And the Western were like, okay, you can have it. And then Hitler makes another demand and he makes another demand. It's the classic, if you give a mouse a cookie, he'll want a glass of milk scenario. And we do not want to do that with the Soviets because eventually they make a demand that you're not willing to give in on. Uh, this whole idea that is containment necessary you know, the, the powers that be don't have the uh, benefit of the future knowledge and things like that. So uh, 
uh, from they, they definitely see communism as a threat to the United States. Uh, the, the two ideologies cannot really coexist. And so think of containment as the broad kind of foundation foreign policy that the United States creates, and they're going to implement that. Eisenhower, uh, as next president, will have his version of it, Kennedy and so on. But the idea here at the end of the day, containment is kind of the, the driving energy behind a lot of our decisions early on. Truman will implement his doctrine really first in Turkey and Greece. The Soviets are trying to kind of put pressure in that part of the world. The United States will show up and give you a bunch of money, political support, etc. And that will allow, hopefully, the, the ideology is that that brings you to our side more so than the Soviets, will be successful in Greece and Turkey. So that will kind of highlight to the uh, to the world that maybe this is something that we can do again, kind of replicate, and we'll try that with mixed results going forward. We'll also do the Marshall Plan. This is named after George Marshall, former um, chief of staff of the Army, Secretary of State. And the idea here is to try to rebuild Western Europe. The, if you remember after World War I, the continent was war-torn. Germany was bankrupt, they were punished, the, made to pay all of this stuff. So we try to avoid some of these sins from World War I uh, and certainly don't want to do them again. Uh, the other purpose is if, if you're a war-torn nation or a city or whatever, and a bunch of supplies start showing up stamped made in America, the United States can use this as kind of like a propaganda plan. The idea here is that we're supporting you, you we're your friend, pay no attention to the Soviets because we're basically building allies. Uh, the impact here economically um, is, is it does have some effects in places, but really the, the long term impact is kind of tying Western Europe to the United States. Uh, we will run into some problems with Germany. Germany has been partitioned up. This was done at Yalta as well. Uh, the Soviets will have a zone. The Americans have a zone. British have a zone and the French have a zone. So you have an allied zone. Basically, we're, we're going to reunite all of the allied zones. And ultimately, you can see in point E, West Germany, uh, the Russians will create East Germany. The issue for the Americans comes in and that Berlin is located in the far east part of Germany, so very far into East Germany itself. And it's the capital of the city, it creates some geopolitical issues for us. And then Stalin, being Stalin, decides to blockade the whole city and is willing to starve the capital of Germany into... Uh, submission as, as a way to, to make a point to, to the West. Truman isn't going to back down from this. We're not just going to like give Germany away. And we institute what's called the Berlin Airlift. You can see a picture of it there on the right. The idea here is that we will just airlift everything a major city needs. Now think of the difficulty and challenges associated with that. We, and remember, Berlin's been bombed to all, to all heck and back because of World War II, just a, a few years previously, concluding the Russians actually invaded Berlin. We bombed it throughout the war. So the, the city needs everything. We're, we're just going to fly them in, and we're going to dare the, the Russians to shoot us down because we get to look like the, the global good guy here. Right? You have Stalin strangling a city, and the Americans are doing everything we can to make sure that city, city can stay alive. So... Ultimately, after 11 months, Stalin does realize the resolve that Truman has to do this. I mean, planes are landing, are landing uh, every you know few minutes at times. The logistics of doing this are incredible. Um, but now once this happens and once East Germany is created, West Germany gets created, Churchill gives his speech in England saying an iron curtain has descended. And this kind of becomes uh, the defining phrase for the East-West divide of Europe and then specifically Germany kind of becomes the front line of this uh, Cold War conflict. Uh, and then a couple of decades later in the 60s when they actually build the actual Berlin Wall, you really get a literal Iron Curtain, uh, which will divide the city in half. As So here you just have another picture titled the Marshall Plan. You can see everybody looking up at the what is titled the first cargo of Caribbean sugar shipped under Marshall aid. So again, it's got the big red, white, and blue seal, you know, shield up top, and we're just showing the American and uh, kind of West support for Europe. So here on this map, what we can see here is uh, foreign aid, military, economic aid. You can see the lion's share of this is going to Europe, uh, specifically Western Europe. Uh, you can see Latin America, Asia, not really getting nearly as much uh, as the Europeans are. Again, because Europe is the, the kind of 
And here's an airplane and children looking up at it to kind of get at the Berlin airlift for you. So here we see uh, on the left, you've got the, the lighter shade of red, pink, whatever you want to call that. These would be your satellite states. So GDR is East Germany. Uh, then you have Poland, Czech Republic, not yet, excuse me, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria. These then become that buffer zone for the darker red of Soviet Union proper. And uh, obviously purple is Yugoslavia. These were independent, but yet allied with the Soviets uh, as well. On the left side, you can see how we're dividing up Germany. You've got the, the kind of the, the solid blue is, will be East Germany and then left uh, of the and West Germany. And you can see where Berlin is marked there as well. So you can see what we're having to do. We're having to fly all the way into Berlin, very much challenging uh, Stalin's blockade um, and daring them to do something about it. Containment continuing in Europe, we realize that we're going to have to do different things at home uh, in our, our policies around the world. So we passed the National Security Act of 1947. This changes War Department to Defense Department. Defense Department sounds uh, safer, more good guy than War Department. We also will create a separate Air Force with this act. So the, the United States Air Force gets spun off from the Army. We'll create the National Security Council. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's a council of individuals to security issues still around today. Uh, we create the CIA, Central Intelligence Agency, spin them off from the OSS, the Office of Special Services. These guys are still around today. And we begin to see a rapid increase in the uh, intelligence agencies over the next few decades, et cetera, till we get to today. And I think we have roughly 17 publicly acknowledged uh, intelligence agencies. And we'll also institute a peacetime draft in 1948 to prepare for conflicts, future conflicts, et cetera. 1949, we'll crank out NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. This is a, a landmark um, organization for the United States in that it represents the first peacetime military alliance that the country will voluntarily join. So what you see here in post-World War II is a massive departure from the isolationist kind of ideology that has dominated the, the United States foreign policy since Washington's farewell address. Post-World War II, we will never be isolationist again. Uh, it's hard to be an isolationist country when you're involved in the United Nations, when you're involved in NATO, uh, and you're going to be in everybody's business around the world up until right now as you're listening to this. Uh, but with NATO, Again, the United States is the only nation with nukes at this particular time, so that nuke umbrella has been extended over Western Europe. Everyone who joins NATO, it's a mutual uh, defense pact, basically is what it is. One country gets attacked, everybody else helps out, and everybody knows that if the Americans help out against the Soviets, we'd help out with nukes. Um, the Soviets will always dominate us with, in number of like soldiers, tanks, aircraft, stuff like that, and so the nuke becomes the big equalizer early on. In response, a few years later, the Soviets will form the Warsaw Pact, which is basically their version of NATO. Right? It includes the buffer zone, Soviet Union, et cetera. Uh, so you have these two big organizations on either side of the seesaw um, poised for, for global conflict. So how do we ensure our national security early on? We do it with atomic weapons. Uh, we obviously have the, the first ones. We use them in World War II, Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan. And then we start building a stockpile of them. And we estimate that we have a pretty good lead time on the Soviets, uh, that our technology, we've come up with it, we've researched it, we've tested, developed it, et cetera, is, is just years and years ahead of the Soviets. So imagine the American surprise when the Soviets first test a successful weapon in 1949. It's a huge wake-up call for the United States, and instantaneously we've realized our technology has probably been stolen. Uh, that's really the only way the Soviets could catch up with it. We'll touch on that here in a couple of slides. In response, we will pass the what's called NSC-68. This is the blueprint. This is how we will try to contain communism. What it calls for is a complete and radical change to the way we've done business in the past. So you need to have a massive military buildup. A, a global, almost permanent army, basically, um, to resist uh, the Soviets and their expansion ideas around the world. Uh, 
we will roll in what's called the hydrogen bomb or the H bomb. This is a more powerful weapon. So the weapons we dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were known as A bombs. They're atomic bombs or fission weapons. They they fissure, they split the atom uh, to create the, the blast of, of the weapon. A hydrogen bomb takes it to the next level. That's what's called a fusion weapon, where basically you, you take hydrogen bomb, uh, hydrogen atoms, and under force, you ram them together to create helium. And then you have a massive uh, release of energy when that process occurs. This is fundamentally what the sun does. Um, and so basically a hydrogen bomb is, is one of the, like, the most powerful weapon we've created. It actually requires an atomic bomb to trigger it, to put it in perspective for you. Uh, so these are this much bigger weapons, far more destructive, far scarier. And, and it is a, an example of the, the ongoing arms race. You know, we develop atomic weapons, the Soviets develop them, we build the H-bomb, the Russians build H-bombs, we'll build a bigger bomb, they'll build one bigger than that. And you basically you know, are, are just ramping up because you wanna be ahead. And that the H-bomb is a driving force behind that and how NSC-68 will work because you need to have the powerful weapons as the big stick, as the threat to stop Soviet aggression. So here you can see the budgets uh, on the far left in blue, just actual billions of dollars. In the middle in red is the percent of the budget, and then in green on the far right, percent of the GNP, the gross national product. So what we see here is that you can see defense spending drastically increases from 1940, uh, peaking in 1990. Remember the Cold War is gonna be over in the early 90s. Uh, but when you look at it, it's really the, the 1950s, 60s, when you look at the percent of the budget, 1960, is more than 50% of the of our federal budget is being spent on national defense issues. And you see 9.5% of our GNP. And then even though we spend more money going into the future, it becomes um, a lower percentage because the United States is just making more money. But you can see it is dominating the, the spending of the country. So we've been talking a lot about what's been going on in Europe. Let's start looking at what's going on in Asia. The Cold War will be a global conflict, and it will involve more countries than just the United States and the Soviet Union. So after Japan surrenders, the United States will move into Occupy Japan. We begin rebuilding Japan as well. Uh, we signed the U.S.-Japanese Security Treaty. Uh, we're going to actually write their constitution for them. It's actually called the MacArthur Constitution that Douglas MacArthur uh, wrote. Uh, we limit their size of their military to really no larger than what they need to defend themselves. It's, even today, it's called the JDF, uh, the Japanese Defense Force, and the United States promises to take on the bulk of their regional security for them, et cetera. We have military bases over there, uh, huge air bases. The Marine Corps ha has a big base over there as well. And the Philippines gained their independence. That's a throwback all the way back to the Tidings McDuffie Act where we said that would be the case. Uh, this is why we didn't care about Filipino immigration, et cetera, because we're going to cut them loose. So we do after World War II. We do maintain bases there that will be important during the Vietnam conflict. And, uh, but ultimately, they are an independent country. And then Truman's going to lose China, kind of like a set of car keys. Like, where did I leave China? By losing China, we're mean we're going to lose China to the communists. You've got Chiang Kai-shek versus Mao Zedong. Uh, this is, should be a, hopefully a review for you guys from world history. Uh, ultimately, we're going to spend a bunch of money and time and effort trying to keep China from falling. And Mao Zedong is going to win because he has the support of the peasants and you look at the Chinese population, demographics, et cetera. That's the group you need. And uh, they will flee to Taiwan. And then you have the PRC, the People's Republic of China. So Taiwan, we are the legitimate government of China. And the United States won't recognize communist China as the legitimate government until Nixon. Uh, in the late 60s, early 70s time period. And this still comes up in the news uh, when President Trump got uh, uh, elected and one of the first calls he took was from the leader of Taiwan, which <laughs> very significantly angered the Chinese. Uh, usually the presidents of the United States don't take that phone call because this China is very sensitive about this, uh, even to this day. But communism will take over in China. They will very quickly turn around and sign what's called the Sino-Soviet Pact of 1950. This is basically Russia and China, Soviet Union and China getting together and, and saying if one of us is attacked, we'll back each other up. And like with the stroke of a pen, almost half the world's population is now under the iron grasp of communist countries. And 
that doesn't really bode well for the American containment policy. We did not really at all, and that uh, will be a blow to Truman, and it will become an issue in the uh, the upcoming election as well. So here we see uh, everybody cheering Mao Zedong as the communists take over China, and again, this will lead to roughly approximately 60 million deaths in China. Okay, so we're going to actually start shooting at people with this now uh, in Korea. What you're going to have here is at the end of World War II, uh, Japanese occupied Korea was divided along the 30th parallel. Just take the line on the map, north uh, surrendered in the north, you surrendered to the Russians. South of that line, you surrendered to the Russians. Uh, so that's going to set up kind of a communist North Korea and a non communist South Korea. Uh, North Korea will invade June 25th, 1950. Uh, their leader, Kim Il-sung, is the grandfather of the current leader of North Korea. You had Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il, and then you have the current leader of uh, North Korea, which is his grandson. The invasion is pretty successful. It catches everybody off guard. Uh, this becomes a United Nations action. This is not a, a United States declaration of war against Korea. This becomes a, a UN, what they call a police action or a peacekeeping force to support a free South Korea. Now, granted, the United States will be leading this force with approximately 80% of the military hardware, money, soldiers, et cetera. Uh, we put Douglas MacArthur in charge. This actually ends the occupation of Japan early because we, we need to then jack the, the number of the army back up. So we pull a lot of those dudes out of Japan, send them to Korea. Uh, MacArthur does a very famous landing at Incheon, uh, which is a big flanking attack. We'll look at it on the map here in a second. Uh, and then they will drive all the way to, to the Chinese border in the north. And the Chinese had warned us, they're like, don't come within the border. And MacArthur's like, big whoop, want to fight about it. What are you going to do? And then the Chinese send like 200,000 soldiers across the border. And the Americans are at Herman Gurr. And we then end up retreating. Uh, MacArthur gets into fights with Truman. MacArthur is very famous for World War II, is the guy in charge of Korea. Starts writing letters in the newspaper uh, back home, being critical of Truman, uh, not really following Truman's commands, et cetera. And so Truman ultimately fires him, relieves MacArthur of command, and is actually supported by the army, by the, by the senior leadership of the army in this. Although, back home for doing this. MacArthur is very popular, uh, but Truman ultimately is commander-in-chief, can't have your generals just running around doing whatever you want. So here you'll look at the map of the Korean War. So here you have your 38th parallel right in the middle, North Invade. You can see Seoul is the capital of South Korea, and Pyongyang will ultimately end up being the capital of North. And those two cities are relatively close to one another for how much these two sides don't like one another. So you can see them push all the way down to what's called the Pusan Perimeter, where they nearly pushed the Allied forces into the ocean. Then you see the Incheon landing November 25th, 50 over there. The North Koreans are caught completely off guard by that. We slam into them like with a hammer, drive north. Uh, then the Chinese come in, push us back. You know, places like Chosin and Reservoir, things like that. And then the front will stabilize right around. Ultimately, that black line on the far right is where the war ends. So you, a lot of times you'll hear Korea say it starts and ends roughly in the same place. You can see in the picture there, it kind of does. And the other nickname that Korea has, the Korean War has, is that it is the Forgotten War. It's called the Forgotten War because it's lumped in kind of between World War II and Vietnam. And But there are some important points for us to, to take away from Korea. Number one, um, for social issues, it is the first desegregated war for the United States military. Uh, here you can see the picture of uh, white soldiers, African-American soldiers fighting side by side. World War II had been segregated, but with uh, the, the coming Korean conflict, it is desegregated. Truman is really one of the first presidents since like, pretty much Lincoln to address civil rights, and we'll get into that here in a little bit as well. So what are the consequences of Korea? The last three years, the final two years of it basically being a major stalemate, meaning that there's not much action um, and territory exchanging hands or anything like that. Uh, it creates a DMZ, a demilitarized zone, which is very infamous today. It's the most militarized, most dangerous border in the world. World's largest minefield is there today. 54,000 US soldiers will die. 
So almost as costly as Vietnam and a much shorter amount of time. And uh, the political consequences are we see like, we got to have a huge military. We can't be caught unaware again. And this brings us back to NSC 68, National Security Council 68. Uh, our defense spending grows in response to the Korean War. You can see it there um, from 13 to 50 billion. And you, this becomes an opportunity for Truman to get because we didn't really win in the sense, right? we didn't take out the North Korean government. Um, we have lost China as well. And we bring back the Munich analogy of, of appeasement and, and not standing firm, uh, et cetera. Ironically enough though, Korea does, we do protect the South Koreans from falling to communism. Uh, and so in that respect, it is successful. This also will leave a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths and will set up um, some attitudes towards Vietnam in just a decade or so as well. So one of the other things we'll see as response to NSC 68 is you call for a huge military, you have to have all these weapons of war, you've got the H-bomb, all of these things. These things have to get built. Uh, you, people have to build these things. So what this means is with NSC 68, you see a big rise in what we'll call the military industrial complex, the MIC. So this will be a huge driving force in the United States. You see a lot of defense contracts, uh, companies growing up being formed uh, to handle this. This drives a large movement of people around the country, predominantly to the West Coast. So in the top part of the image, you can see uh, the old industrial states certainly uh, are still important, but the West Coast is, is growing as well, specifically California. On the bottom part of that image, you can see all of the different major plants, minor plants, aircraft parts, ordnance, um, this really drives a lot of movement to California, specifically uh, with decent, high-paying, middle-class jobs, which we'll get into in the 1950s chapter about the social aspects of it. But this is a, a huge effect on society back home, uh, as shown to you guys here in this image. So here we see early on during the war years as well, uh, defense spending drives a big chunk of federal spending. Another image really showing you the importance of the dollar value being put on the defense industries uh we saw it earlier with the percentage gnp and, and percent of the budget etc so there's another image showing the same thing so back home uh outside of conflicts here we look at what's going on at home so truman fdr's vp expects him to try to be a new deal guy which he will try to be uh there's still concerns the great depression can come back at the end of world war ii uh, because World War II doesn't really address the Great Depression. Uh, you, you basically, you have a bunch of people working for the government in the form of the military, and now you don't need them. The industries have to switch over from wartime to peacetime economics, and th there's a fear that, that a lot of the same problems could come back. Uh, so definitely want to try to revive the New Deal. If you're a Democrat, which Truman is, uh, they, they push for national health care. This will be a dream of the Democrat Party. Uh, pretty much from FDR, Truman, on all the way up to President Obama and the Affordable Health Care Act. And then you see um, people still talking about it, Bernie Sanders talking about, you know, Medicare for all, et cetera. So this is a long-term goal for, for the Democrat Party. Raise minimum wage, et cetera. Uh, they'll do an employment act. You have full versus max employment, looking at, like, do you want everybody working or is a certain amount of unemployment healthy, et cetera. Create the Council of Economic Advisors. This is still around today, uh, very similar to the National Security Council in that it's a group of advisors to the president, the NSC, National Security, economic advisors advising the president on economic issues. Uh, as we come back, and we loosen up the price controls we had during the war where we're saying, hey, a gallon of milk is only gonna cost X amount of dollars. Uh, you see a lot of inflation because we've been artificially controlling prices. You see a bunch of workers go on strike, very similar to what we saw at the end of World War I. Uh, guys are turning home, industries changing over, they, they're upset about a lot of things. Uh, specifically at the end of World War II, we're looking at steel, coal, and railroad industries. This really angers Truman, and he threatens actually to, to take over the industries and then draft the workers and then send them back. Now this will be, the Supreme Court says you can't do this. The Taft-Hartley Act will be very much anti-union when we get to it in a second. We'll look at that. and we'll Continue with post-war politics. And civil rights, he really is, as stated before, uh, one of the first presidents since Lincoln to really address civil rights. He desegregates the army. 
forms uh, what's called the Committee on Civil Rights to look at civil rights issues in, in the, the late 40s. Uh, strengthens the Civil Rights Division. Uh, there you can see Indian de uh, segregation. And he will get pushed back, as hopefully is expected at this point in our course, from Southern states and, and predominantly Southern Democrats who have been in power since Reconstruction, basically, and are going to resist any efforts on equality issues. So here we'll get into some, some of the economics. Republicans will take control of Congress. Uh, Truman will veto some tax cuts. And uh, the for those of you playing along at home, the 22nd Amendment is in response to FDR's four presidential terms. It limits the president to two terms of four years and no more than 10 years total. Why 10 years? Because they're putting in an allotment in case you were vice president and the president died, resigned, impeached, what have you, uh, and then you would take over. It still gives you a little bit of wiggle room to try to get two full elected terms in there as well. So 22nd Amendment, two terms for the president, 2-2. Two, two. So the Taft-Hartley Act gets passed. Truman's going to veto this as well. Congress will actually override this one. This amends the Wagner Act. The Wagner Act was the big union um, legislation during the New Deal. And you can see here, the, the, the Taft-Hartley Act it looks like it's going to go against the unions a little bit. So we're going to prohibit closed shops. Uh, closed shops are, are, you know, closed basically to, to anyone who to get a job there. We're going to prohibit political donations to political parties from unions. Uh, secondary boycotts will be outlawed and allows what are called right to work state laws, et cetera. So you, you see this, the labor unions become a big dividing issue going into the 50s and 60s between the Democrats and Republicans. Uh, unions will be at an all-time high, World War II, 50s, somewhat into the 60s, and you begin to see a decline uh, into the 70s, 80s to what we have today, where pretty much anywhere Republicans are in power for the most part is going to be right to work, kind of anti-union, where Democrats are going to be much more pro-union workers, even to, to this day in the 21st century. So we're going to have an election, 1948. So remember, FDR was elected in 44. Truman takes over in 45. 48. So this is, again, this is uh, before Korea a little bit. We kind of did a big chunk of the Cold War. Now we're kind of rewinding a little bit and looking at domestic politics uh, here as well. So you've got Give em Hell Harry versus Dapper Dewey. Dapper meaning like very kind of handsome, cheap looking, etc. Uh, Truman goes after what he calls the do-nothing Congress. Up until this point in history, this was the Congress that had done the least as far as legislation, uh, hence do-nothing. You have Dixie crack concerns, Southern Democrats. Uh, why are those guys around? You've got the civil rights issues at play. You've got progressive concerns. So even though we said World War I kind of ends progressivism as a movement, there's still the ideology in place. If you think about it as the New Deal is a very progressive kind of series of, of uh, ideas. So there's still those concerns as well. Don't want the Great Depression to come back, et cetera. Uh, Dewey looks like he's going to win. This is a, that leads to holding up the newspaper that says Dewey defeats Truman. Even though Truman's going to win, the newspapers went to print the night before thinking Dewey was going to win. Truman just really campaigns hard in the, in the waning hours of, of the moving up into the election and uh, really is able, he's FDR's guy, New Deal Democrat, et cetera, et cetera, can really just gets the message out, grinds it out. And so we're going to have the fair deal. So we had Teddy Roosevelt do the square deal. And then you had FDR, his cousin, do the new deal. And then you have Truman doing the fair deal. So again, we're going to try to extend new deal programs. Um, some of them will be successful. Some of them won't. Uh, Republicans will block pretty much everything in Congress with the exception of minimum wage, social security increase. Uh, the National Housing Act of 49, this helps with mortgages, housing issues, obviously. Uh, lack of success on, on this is, is he's blocked and the Cold War dominates. It's pretty hard to, to look at what you think is an existential threat to your way of life in the Soviet Union with nukes and armed races and conflicts all over the place and still be able to be focused on stuff at home and really advocate and push and get people behind you for that as well. It's a, it's a very chaotic, very dangerous time in the world, and, and you, you can't do everything. 
So here, down here in the bottom left, Dewey defeats Truman. That's Truman holding up the newspaper. Uh, and this is why, like, in the 2016 election, you, you saw magazines printing, you know, uh, covers with Hillary on it, with Trump on it, just in case. So they're ready to go. Um, but none of them just went all in on one side. Uh, even though some of them had shipped one version or the other, they still had the other one. You can see the map up here. It's kind of an ugly mess. Tom Thurman. Uh, running as a quote Dixie Crat, winning several of the small state or the southern states. Dewey. So the mass all hodgepodge, kind of like not traditionally what we've seen uh, in the past. And um, you know, notice there that Wallace, as the progressive, doesn't win a single state, but is able to pull votes, etc. But ultimately, Truman wins and uh, will continue to be president until uh, the election of '52, and will go out in '53. Part of the, the housing concerns, and this will become a big deal uh, when Johnson is president in the, the mid to late 60s, is looking at housing for the economically depressed. One of the things we'll see as we move into the 1950s chapter is that the 1950s is a great decade unless you are poor, a minority. Um, it's not all all rosy so we see here here's a big housing complex government housing type things become a thing uh this looks great early on and uh but will become a, a collection of problems in the late 60s and 70s which we'll get into when we get there as well but again they are trying to address housing needs for the nation's poor and now we'll we'll switch back to some cold war stuff but we'll look at it cold war stuff at home so just like world war one led to a red scare you had the palmer raids etc with, with the first red scare uh world war ii will will lead to a second red scare and the other phrase or word we can use for this is mccarthyism named after joseph mccarthy a center so causes again soviet aggression around the world uh they rise into the country they steal our, our nuke secrets from us etc and what does a communist look like? There is no communist uniform. They could be your neighbor. They could be your boss or, you know, your best friend. No, you just don't really know. And that's the fear. So you see the same thing in, in the first Red Scare as well. We'll do loyalty review boards where they actually bring employees in and, and straight up ask you and, and test your loyalty. Um, we are able to prosecute you for, for different things. Um, the Smith Act makes this a thing. Uh, the Dennis et al. versus the U.S., this harkens back to the to the Shank case, the clear and present danger type stuff, where uh, we, we will criminalize associations and behavior, even though you would think that they would be constitutionally protected, even if they are against uh, the, the values of the country, et cetera. Um, but yeah, so we do do that during this time period. Uh, we'll, with the Internal Security Act, we'll register communist groups with the government, investigate your activities, Again, you have to remember things like uh, Miranda rights don't exist during this time period. So they're, you're not being, quote, read your rights if you're detained. Uh, that's a 1960s thing. Uh, so we, we do get pretty deep into uh, some civil rights issues, not black, white civil rights, but just civil rights as citizens uh, of the United States here during this time period. You have the House on American Activities Committee. This is the big vocabulary word you would need to know for this one, uh, McCarthyism, and, and then uh, HUAC, as they call it. Uh, Nixon shows up here as an attorney. Nixon will go on to be uh, Eisenhower's vice president, governor of California, future president. And then blacklisting comes back when the Hollywood 10 would be another name drop for an essay or something like that, where these are, are 10 people in Hollywood that get accused of this and refuse to testify and they put them in prison, et cetera. Uh, so yeah, so th this, this rips through American society, a lot of fear, a lot of paranoia gets written during this time period uh, the the famous play about the witch trials in salem back in the day in massachusetts and obviously there's parallels with the the quote witch hunt of communists and this is definitely a time period where if you get accused of being a communist it's, it can ruin your life uh, this is also why in the 1950s you see a lot of social conformity uh, to be different was to be maybe considered to be a communist and so when you look at pictures of the 1950s, in, in part, everybody's wearing the same thing. You look at the guys, right? The gray suit jacket, the white shirt, the black tie, the, the crew cut haircut. Um, and so then you'll see when we get to the 50s chapters, like their kids will kind of reject some of this. 
you have the beats and then later on the, the counterculture of the 60s and the hippies. But there are real espionage cases going around as well. Alger Hiss uh, is accused of being a spy. Uh, you have the Rosenbergs. This is probably the most famous, Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. They, they pretty much arrest his wife and accuse her, thinking it'll make him crack. Uh, history has shown there's not a ton of evidence to show, if any, that she was actually guilty of anything. He probably was. That Either way, they are both found guilty and executed for espionage. Um, there, there are criticisms of, of racism, et cetera, because they are Jewish individuals. And so there, there's cries of anti-Semitism, makes it easier to convict you, et cetera. Uh, but Julius Rosenberg is, is pretty much confirmed that he was sneaking secrets. And then you have the Venona files where this is showing us, hey, we know who communist spies are, and we're not going to do anything about it for all of them because we know they're a spy, therefore we can isolate them. If we catch them, put them on trial, et cetera, the Soviets will just send somebody else and we won't know who it is. So Venona is a huge like kind of spy research project uh, that, that lends a lot of information in this kind of this covert war between the communists. So here you see just some images uh, on the top left, you know, free the Hollywood 10 people protesting the, the accusations. Hollywood gets hit pretty hard during this time period. Uh, Reagan, actually, uh, Ronald Reagan uh, has a, he, he dimes some people out, future governor and president of the United States. Uh, bottom left, you have Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. Uh, bottom right, you have Nixon. Uh, and then the top is the Alger Hiss trial, uh, et cetera. So continuing with McCarthyism. You've got specifically Joseph McCarthy. This is who this is named after. Uh, he goes after uh, a lot of different people. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, this puts a big media eye on it because of the fear. Uh, and no one wants to be accused of this. This gives him a lot of power. Uh, working middle class Americans love it because he's going after, you know, communists. We're going to root them out, not take no lip from anybody. At first, Republicans don't like it early on. He is a Republican, um, but it does really help them in the 1952 election. It will ultimately backfire on McCarthy. Uh, he goes after George Marshall, who was a personal friend of, of Eisenhower. Marshall actually promoted Eisenhower in World War II to make Ike the Supreme Allied Commander. Um, and, and to give you an idea of McCarthy's power, like Eisenhower can't really criticize him when he goes after Marshall. Marshall's got to take it on the chin. But when McCarthy starts going after the army as a whole, you begin to see Eisenhower push back. And then in 1954, um, he's, he's going after people and he's just, he's just seen as a bully. And this is where the famous phrase, have you no decency, sir? Calling McCarthy out. And he's just exposed, right? A lot of this stuff was real. There were Soviets infiltrating the United States. Um, but the manner of going about it, it kind of becomes this whole idea becomes more about him. And being famous, et cetera, et cetera, and the power. Um, and a lot of fake accusations are made, and a lot of people's lives do get ruined as well, just like you see in the first Red Scare. Ultimately, the Senate will finally step in and censor McCarthy, and then he'll die of alcoholism uh, about three years later. You can see here showing the Communist Party organization. That's him standing up at the map. Um, this is when he's going after the army, et cetera. And you start doing that. Eisenhower, obviously, is general in the army. It's just not, not going to play well for you. Once I kind of goes after him, it kind of signals the, the beginning of the end. So here, uh, obviously, we're not going to have a class discussion on a recording, but take a moment and ask yourself, how does this Red Scare anti-communism hysteria, how is that going to impact our politics, our foreign policy, our society at home? I've touched on a little bit of this already, but just take a moment, ask yourself that, because this could easily be an essay question you guys could see uh, going after the effects of McCarthyism or the effects of the second Red Scare. So now we're switching gears. We're going to move in to look at Eisenhower. Uh, obviously, he's a soldier, career army guy, supreme allied commander, overarching strategy in Europe, is the first commander of NATO. You pretty much can't do more than what Eisenhower did as a military commander. Does not have political experience in the sense that he's not a, a big elected guy, but you don't run the entire army in World War II in Europe without being an excellent uh, organizer and administrator and, and task assigner type thing. He does what's called the hidden hand presidency. One of the criticisms Eisenhower has is that he doesn't appear to do a lot himself, but he's also really good at recognizing talent and tapping those guys and, and, and 
here's your job, here's your agency, you run it, this is my goal, accomplish it. He's very good at doing that. Um, the, the big criticism is that he's very popular and, and very effective leader, but does not leverage that during the 1950s while Dr. King is, is really pushing the, the civil rights movement in the South. Uh, Eisenhower will desegregate Little Rock very famously. We'll touch on that in the civil rights chapter, but, but Ike doesn't push for any type of civil rights acts or anything like that. doesn't use his popularity for that. So Eisenhower is going to run against a guy named Adelai Stevenson. The Democrats are kind of down. Um, Korea is not going very well. Uh, Truman has lost China. Uh, so you got Ike, World War II hero. You put him with Nixon, who is, is hardcore anti-communist. He's been associated with McCarthyism, et cetera. And the Republicans are able to win basically on a strategy of Korea, corruption, and communism. We're going to go after Korea. We're going to win that war. We're going to be very strong anti-communist, and we're going to like root out corruption in the government, et cetera. So you've got Nixon there. He called it out, Dean Atchison's College of Cowardly Communist Containment. You'll see Eisenhower take a different approach to containment. Uh, Nixon will be accused of taking like different campaign finance issues and, and is almost kicked off the ticket by Ike because he's, he's, he's potentially going to bring down uh, the campaign. And then he goes on TV and gives what's called the checkers speech. We talked about how he received a puppy as part of a campaign thing, and his family named it checkers, and his daughters love it, and yada, yada, yada. And so the idea of the checkers speech here is it really kind of humanizes and Nixon gets him back in, in good graces with Ike and really begins to show the power of television because it, Nixon is, is, a, is, a, is doing this on TV and, and really... Uh, you can kind of see the emotion and not just hear the voice or something like that. Uh, so coming rise of power of TV, we'll definitely see in 1960, ironically enough, with Nixon again in the debates with Kennedy and Nixon for the presidency. So we'll touch on, on TV in the future, but certainly keep that in the back of your mind. Television is a rising thing. So here we go. We've got Eisenhower. Uh, we said he is a, a, a popular guy, 55% of the vote, large electoral college win. Republicans take over full control of Congress. Why do you see the Democrat hold on the South uh, slipping away? Civil rights stuff starting to come along. Uh, as and, and that's going to be the big thing going into the 1960s. So not quite there yet. So again, Eisenhower is elected in the middle of the Korean War. So Ike will wrap up the Korean War as well. So Ike really kind of represents a, a, a new Republican Party. Uh, they'll be fiscally conservative, so you won't see pushing tax type stuff, civil spending. We're going to spend a lot of money on defense, but uh, but very moderate on domestic kind of social issues. Try to balance spending, meaning like spending money you don't have. But Ike does really, from the Republican side, kind of accept the New Deal. You don't see Eisenhower try to dismantle New Deal stuff. As a matter of fact, he does the opposite. He expands Social Security, raises minimum wage improves unemployment benefits, farm subsidies are extended, money to farmers, et cetera. Uh, the Federal Housing Authority, again, you see that we talked about that with uh, the Housing Act, with the, the government housing, mortgage re relief, stuff like that. Uh, these are very much in New Deal kind of uh, ideas. And, and Ike kind of just goes with it at the time period. Eisenhower is largely going to be a, a foreign policy president uh, with the, the exception of the civil rights stuff. Speaking of foreign policy, we'll talk about uh, Ike's foreign policy here. So his guy, John Foster Dulles, Secretary of State, doesn't really like the containment of Truman, uh, really calls for a more proactive idea, the idea that we need to go liberate nations that are being held captive by communist dictators. So a much more forceful, interactive foreign policy will advocate what he calls brinkmanship, the idea of taking them right to the brink, take them to the edge basically, and then they'll blink before we do. How do we do that? Right, because we have the nukes. Yes, they have them too, but we hopefully, you know, the idea is we're gonna have more of them and a willingness to use them and we will scare you into doing what we want you to do. Uh, so this will, will dominate Eisenhower's foreign policy. Continuing with Foster Dulles, we have uh, what's called the New Look Military. So the idea of the New Look Military <clears throat> excuse me, is uh, rather than have millions of people in the army, 
soldiers on the ground, tanks, et cetera. Like these are vulnerable to nukes now. Uh, you really push for, for high altitude, high speed bombers, large uh, nuclear weapons, and you, you look for a massive retaliation uh, capability. So more bang for the buck, quite literally, because you're spending a lot of money on nukes. This accelerates the arms race as we pursue in NSC 68 to its ultimate kind of realization and brings on the onset of what's called MAD, a mutually assured destruction. So everybody knows if you launch on us, yeah, you might take us out, but it's going to take time for your missiles to get here. And in that 30 to 45 minute window, we're going to launch ours and we're going to lay waste to you. So, and both sides know this. So it kind of keeps us locked in place. Um, or if we launch on the Russians, the Russians, Russians will launch back, vice versa. Um, and so kind of a, a very tenuous, dangerous time to be living in the country. Um, you see Europe has kind of stabilized uh, in this Cold War. And so you see the, the conflicts shift out to Africa, Southeast Asia, uh, Vietnam, basically, is coming with that one. And then the Middle East uh, with uh, some Suez Canal stuff, which we'll get into what they call brush fire wars. So not huge, you know, conflicts or anything like that, but definitely uh, conflict between uh, the West and the Soviets. At home, everybody is freaking out. They create the Civil Defense Administration. So these are the guys that will you know, make the radio announcements, etc. cetera. Uh, you have a bunch of people building fallout shelters or, uh, or bunkers, you know, et cetera. So if the the alarm goes off, you run down in the bunker to try to live uh, through the, the explosion. Uh, about one in 20 people will have them built. You can go see a lot of old buildings that were built during this time period or shortly before it, they'll have uh, fallout shelter signs on them because uh, they still have these facilities built down into them, et cetera. So very, like I said, very fearful time uh, because these weapons can't reach the uh, the United States and, and around the world uh, very quickly. Uh, I can't give you the actual times. I did work with the ICBM stuff in the Air Force. All that stuff's classified. Uh, but I will tell you that we had t-shirts that said 30 minutes or less or the next one's free. So this is a very um, rapid and very destructive weapon system that now exists in the world. Uh, once we get the, the missile systems which come online during the 50s, um, very, very dangerous. Very, very scary times. Uh, here's a civil defense poster. This is where you also have like the duck and cover drills where we would uh, teach young children to, uh, in case when the, when the sirens go off, you want to get under the desk and uh, duck and cover, right? You want to duck your head down. You want to cover yourself up. That way you have a, uh, a chance to survive uh, a nuclear explosion. If you've ever seen actual test footage of this stuff, and you are in the blast kind of epicenter, uh, ducking cover isn't gonna do anything. It's basically trying to calm the civilian population uh, more than anything else. Give you the idea like, hey, this is something we can do. We can survive these things potentially, et cetera. And then you also have the question of, do you want to survive a nuclear holocaust? Uh, you think about all the infrastructure being destroyed, all of the, the food production, the water, like is that something that you really uh, becomes discussions as well. So again, here, here's a, a the, what you see in the image here. This is an underwater test out in the South Pacific. They wanted to see, um, hey, if we detonate one of these underwater, what does it do to a naval formation? See the ships there in the foreground, that's all the water being blown. They blew chunks of islands off. These things are so powerful. Uh, just incredible weapons. And, and again, just very, very destructive and deadly. So we're gonna shift again. We talked about moving to the third world so after World War II, World War II is obviously a huge change. Hopefully everybody knows that. Uh, Cold War, all of the things we've been talking about. But for the rest of the world, it, it shakes up a lot of the old colonial powers because uh, they're weakened, et cetera. Uh, but these new countries that, that, that are coming about, like they're a little weak. They're trying to stand on their own in a, in a global economy that doesn't really much uh, going for them right now because of the war and then the Cold War sucking up all the resources. So they're looking for, for help. And the Americans and the Soviets are, are here uh, to help them, but that help's going to come with a with a price. So if we help you, you're going to be allied with us. If the Russians, you're going to be communist, which means you are now the adversary of the other side. Uh, so this becomes a a big deal uh, for for everybody in the world. The, 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 nobody is really immune uh, from the Cold War completely. 
and like I said, you become pawns to the to the big powers uh, at play here. So another big change that we see here is as we move into the 50s uh, and the early 60s, it really becomes less of this huge. Uh, uh, we've got new look again. We're down. We're not downsizing, but we don't need million man armies anymore. Uh, covert stuff, sending in a, a single CIA spy. It's secretive. Uh, it's less objectionable, less expensive than sending in an entire army. Uh, and so and then you'll see the agency overthrow a bunch of governments. Now, uh, this will create future problems for us. Uh, we take out the Iranian leadership, put in uh, a guy that's friendly to the United States, the Shah of Iran. This comes back to bite us in, with the Iranian hostage crisis later on. Uh, we'll overthrow the Guatemalan government. This will start a process in Central and South America of where the Americans uh, kind of continue our meddling politics down there. If you think all the way back to uh, Roosevelt and Taft with the dollar diplomacy, um, and then, you know, we try the good neighbor policy under FDR during World War II to mixed results. And then the 50s and 60s, uh, where we're just constantly uh, messing around with them. And then in the future, we'll shift that into the drug war as well. Uh, but we, we put in pro-American dictatorships, which might sound uh, contradictory, but it's the Cold War. And yeah, you might be a bad guy, but you're our bad guy, which is, is what the Americans are looking for at the time. We also start what are called uh, mutual security military assistance programs. This will be the governing kind of thing for what will happen in Vietnam. It'll be called MACV, M-A-C-V, Military Assistance Command Vietnam. And that's kind of how we're going to get involved in that part of the world as well. Uh, again, goes back to the Truman Doctrine, military support, uh, money, training, not so much so that we're going to go fight your war for you. Um, we will in Vietnam. But... This again, right, the idea of we're going to give you physical support to resist communism in your country is very much a Truman idea. So Ike has ended Korea. That's a campaign promise for him. Um, he goes to Korea. We want our prisoners back, et cetera. Uh, but we do finally wrap up the Korean War with, again, not much changing geographically. There's a bunch of people are dead. Uh, Stalin dies. So that's uh, a somewhat good. The, the threats kind of die down a little bit. Um, not that Khrushchev is going to be all that better, but uh, we'll get to that in a second. So in Indochina, this is modern day Southeast Asia. Uh, basically, it's Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos are the countries that, and we're talking about. France, that had been a colony of France. France wants it back, Truman supporting him. Ho Chi Minh will be the leader of the nationalist kind of, and then ultimately a communist movement. We had worked with them during World War II, um, and then during, against the Japanese, and then the, the folks loose. Uh, by 1950, both sides are given aid down there. The Viet Minh, these are Ho Chi Minh's guys, will defeat the French at a place called Dien Bin Phu. This pretty much knocks them out. Uh, we're not gonna go send soldiers or use nukes to back the French. Um, we we really misjudge Ho Chi Minh. We we treat him as this diehard communist, uh, and really he just wanted an independent Vietnam. Um, their Declaration of Independence actually looks a lot like ours. It's modeled after the American one, uh, and, and that misinterpretation is going to to lead to in, in part the Vietnam War, uh, which is coming in the '60s, et cetera. But Eisenhower, the Truman, and Eisenhower, the guys that put the, the military guys there early on. Uh, with the with resources and stuff. Kennedy will really double down on it in the early 60s. And then LBJ Johnson will be off to the races for Vietnam. He's into Nixon, into the 70s. Uh, and, and we'll get to that in a future chapter. So we're almost done, I promise. I know we're, we're hanging tough here. There's a ton of information in this chapter. I appreciate your patience on that. Uh, we have Geneva. This is splits uh, into those three countries. Vietnam's divided into two, north and south with the promise that they'll have unified elections in the future. Uh, the problem is uh, we think those unified elections are going to go Ho Chi Minh's way. And uh, so we, we basically unify very quickly under uh, Diem. He's our guy. Uh, Eisenhower supports this. We send a ton of money into South Vietnam. 
And how do we, why do we justify this? It's called the domino theory. And this is a big takeaway on this slide is that if we don't support Vietnam, Vietnam in a line to dominoes. So if you knock the first domino over, it knocks all the other ones down in a line. So the theory is that if Vietnam falls to communism, all the other countries in the region will also fall to communism. Therefore, the United States needs to prevent the first domino from falling, thus supporting South Vietnam. Uh, CETO gets formed, Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. Uh, this is, again, you can see the countries involved there um, to resist communist aggression, similar to NATO, uh, but in uh, the Southeast Asian, uh, South Pacific region. So here you see a map, you see the countries involved here. So Philippines will be strategic for the coming Vietnam War. You can see the, the divide, similar to, to Korea, right? 38th up in Korea, 17th in Vietnam. Uh, Hanoi is the capital of the north, the capital of the south is Saigon. Uh, today, spoiler alert, it's called Ho Chi Minh City, so that should give you an uh, But again, right, so you can see uh, the, just the territory we're talking about. That. Then we'll switch gears, we'll look at the Middle East. Remember, we talked about how conflicts shift out of Europe to Asia, Africa, Middle East, places like that. Israel's been created. This will create a conflict between them and the Arab states, the Palestinians. The United States uh, is backing Israel, but at the same time, we don't really want to be in constant war with the Arab states because that could drive them into the hands of the Soviets. Uh, so it's a very delicate act for the Americans. Uh, we will ultimately back Israel long term. Uh, they're still a great ally of the country today, only democracy in the region, etc. cetera. Uh, you have Nasser who's running Egypt, the Suez Canal. This connects the Mediterranean to the Red Sea. Uh, he's trying got the U.S. and the Soviet Union. He's like shopping deals um, for support. When we find this out, we're not very friendly with, to that idea. Uh, he wants to build a dam and then basically says like, well, screw it. I'll just take the Suez Canal and we'll shut down that traffic. Well, England, France, Israel, they're not fans of this. Uh, this nearly blows up into a, a much larger conflict, but the United States is able to, to show up in there. and Basically, we use oil uh to to bring everybody to heal oil is becoming a, a major resource you see that in the bottom point there uh and then you have the eisenhower doctrine so the eisenhower doctrine is specific to the middle east all right truman doctrine starts in greece and france the idea that will help you out they they seem very similar but just in your mind connect eisenhower to the middle east uh, and then opec gets formed this is the organization of petroleum exporting countries this will create some problems for us some oil issues going on right now in the United States as well uh, with OPEC and the Russians, etc. So uh, oil becomes and continues to be a major, major global resource as well. So here we have a map uh, showing all the different alliances around the world. You guys can look at that. The Rio Treaty, Central South America, NATO, we talked about, CETO, we talked about, uh, then CENTO, uh, we're an associate state there, we're not a major player. Uh, South Korea, we signed at the end of the Korean War. Uh, we'll defend the Philippines in the 50s as well. We really take on kind of the global policeman, very similar to the Teddy Roosevelt role in the Caribbean, but now we're going to apply that globally. So with Stalin's death, we talked about the anti-communist stuff kind of going away with McCarthyism ending. We kind of like chill on that a little bit. Uh, we talked already about this. Europe's kind of already locked into this stalemate. Uh, Ike tries this Adams for peace thing, slow down in the arms race. The Soviets leave, you know, some places alone. And, and rather than overt force like Berlin airlift and, and different things like that, it, it really becomes. Um, we, we stop playing checkers and start playing chess, basically, is a way to think about it. Intelligence agencies, spying, espionage, influence, peddling, those all become the big dominant ways that we'll fight the Cold War. And the reason we're going to do that is because the nukes just make everything too dangerous. Uh, so we, we have a moment here where we, we think maybe the Cold War can thaw a little bit. Uh, we've got uh, what Eisenhower calls open skies. This was a proposal to where, hey, like you can fly reconnaissance aircraft over America. We can fly reconnaissance aircraft over Russia. Information kind of becomes a big thing. Because uh, we're operating out of fear, paranoia, and ignorance. We don't really know what the Russians are doing 100%. And so we're like, well, this is what we think the Russians are doing. Therefore, we have to react to that. 
And ironically enough, when the Cold War is over and we we find out we had no idea what the other side was doing. Uh, Khrushchev actually criticizes Stalin, right? tries peaceful coexistence, but then the Hungarian revolt happens. Uh, the communists are nearly overthrown. Khrushchev rolls in with tanks uh, and basically starts murdering civilians on the streets, and that starts to freeze uh, everything again. Um, the Americans don't go in either. Remember, Dulles has been talking a big time about intervention and you know, like containment is a, is a silly prospect and we should be fighting these people. And uh, we don't go help the Hungarians. Uh, we actually say, well, that doesn't apply to the satellite states. That's just other places around the world. Uh, and so that kind of puts an end to, to that kind of talk too. Uh, we don't really want to get involved in that conflict. It can blow up to be worse things. And so, uh, yep, it definitely is a, a sad day for Hungary though. So you see some pictures, statue of Stalin being torn down. You can see some tanks in the street. Soviets don't really respond well to threats against their system of government uh, with niceties and diplomacy. And they pretty much show up with tanks. So Eisenhower, uh, 52, is elected in 52, takes over 53. Uh, and then we move into the next, 56, and then we have the next election in 1960. So the Democrats will, will have a guy named John F. Kennedy, probably all heard from him, very unfortunately famous because of the assassination in Dallas. Is a World War II guy, was a captain of a PT boat. Uh, his father had been uh, ambassador to England uh, and involved in politics as well. Kennedy had served in the House and the Senate, uh, marries the very beautiful uh, Jacqueline Bouvier, um, very famous later on, known as Jackie O when she remarries uh, after Kennedy's assassination to a guy named Onassis. And uh, so very beautiful young family. Kennedy's a good looking dude. Um, this will play very well in American politics of the 1960s. So we talked about the influence of television, going back with Nixon's checkers speech. Uh, now, uh, it is in presidential elections. So you've got the Nixon, right? Eisenhower's vice president. Keep the Eisenhower Times rolling. They'll, uh, he'll run with a guy named Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. Remember, his father was very famous for resisting the uh, Treaty of Versailles uh, and debates with Wilson at the end of World War I wouldn't compromise with, with Wilson over the League of Nations. The Democrats nominate Kennedy, very young, uh, criticized somewhat being politically inexperienced. So they pair him with a, a huge longtime Senate guy and Lyndon Johnson. Uh, Johnson was first elected to the Senate during the New Deal. So he's been around for a while, very much a New Deal Democrat guy. Uh, Kennedy's Catholic. And so we still see the anti-Catholic uh, rhetoric being trotted out, being accused, he'll, he was accused of being like, well, if the Pope tells him to do something, he'll do it, even if it's against the constitution. Uh, Kennedy's able to fend that off uh, successfully. Uh, the, the very, is this one 1960 Nixon versus Kennedy 70 million people will tune in to watch this and uh, pretty much is is shows the power of television you will have people who watch this on TV they'll say Kennedy won you'll have people say who listen to it on radio will be like Nixon won. It's the same words and yet the power of the image carries the day for Kennedy Nixon was sweating he looked uncomfortable Kennedy you know, understood the power of image, had makeup on, uh, young guy, et cetera, uh, proves to be very, very successful. Ultimately, they'd have four debates over domestic and foreign topics, and uh, JFK will carry the day on television. Nixon was very never really comfortable with the media, had paranoia issues with him going forward after this, et cetera, uh, which obviously informs what will happen with him on Watergate. But we're not there yet. JFK is going to win, uh, and then we'll get into that. So Kennedy, because you got to have a name, he calls his uh, campaign and policies the new frontier. And uh, you had a, a little recession at the end of the 50s, economic stuff going on. So he's got to fight against that. Kennedy will be a big civil rights guy, urban renewal, poverty, uh, kind of very much a modern Democrat in that response as well. And then he will reject kind of new look. The, the whole idea of the new look stuff and all of that was um, that massive retaliation type stuff. So it's a one size fits all. Hey, they they did this over here, nuke them. They invaded here, nuke them. 
that doesn't really give us a lot of flexibility. So Kennedy favors uh, a, a more flexible response. So, hey, we'll have an option A, an option B, an option C based on what's happening around the world. Up until uh, 2000, this was the closest election in US history. Kennedy wins by 112,000 votes. Uh, the Electoral College is skewed a little bit, but it's a very close election. There are accusations of fraud with the Democrats. Uh, allegedly, Kennedy had mafia help the, the Kennedy family, the mob, through some elections for him, which sets up some problems uh, going forward. Uh, but the, the, the media love Kennedy. He's young. His wife's beautiful. He has young children in the White House, what they call the Camelot presidency. Camelot has come out on Broadway at the time. Uh, he's the youngest president in the history of the United States. And so he's uh, he really marks right, the changing of the guard in a lot of ways, right? Like this, the, the 60s will be different than the, the late 40s and 50s. The Cold War, et cetera. Kennedy has an optimism about uh, his policies. And uh, that plays in, again, to the increased tragedy of his assassination, et cetera. That's the perception of the country at the time. So Kennedy comes in, close election. Uh, he captivates them in a way that, that's rare amongst politicians. So here's your map. Again, you see Bird running again, taking some of the votes, and it's kind of a hodgepodge map, uh, which will, in a way, kind of almost uh, signify the, the craziness of the 1960s. So Kennedy's foreign policy, he, he creates the Peace Corps, wants to win over hearts and minds, the idea of like, you don't really make friends by bombing people. So the Peace Corps, for example, you, you send Americans over there, we, we do nice things for you, we build schools, we help you out in different ways, uh, kind of uh, get you to like us uh, as opposed to you'll fear us type of deal. A line address, this is a plan, uh, land reform, economic growth in Latin America. We're trying to be friends in Latin America. We're trying to build st uh, stability promoting programs around the world. And hopefully you'll be nice to us, you'll be friends with us, and you won't be allied with the Soviets. JFK will also um, challenge NASA to land on the moon, very famous speech where he wants to land a, moon, a man on the moon uh, by the end of the decade. This is done in response, and these are the big ones here, to the Soviets launching Sputnik, the first man-made object to orbit the Earth, and uh, Yuri Gagarin, the, the first man in space. So the, the Soviets are beating the Americans early on, um, and the space race becomes another point of, of confrontation and competition uh, between the two superpowers. Um, the Russians get the early lead, and then the Americans Armstrong, Neil Armstrong, do land on the moon and thus winning the, the moon race, if you will, or the space race. Uh, after they do Sputnik, Sputnik's actually pretty scary for the Americans because you launch a, a rocket into space and it drops off a satellite to orbit the Earth. Well, the fear is if you carry that trajectory a little further with the rocket and then you drop something off, that object will then come back into the atmosphere and strike the Earth. So that's a warhead. Right, that's an intercontinental ballistic missile. So if you can get the satellite into space, you it's not too much further before you figure out the math to bring it back down, uh, which they do with Gagarin. They bring him back. And so uh, we pass the National Defense and Education Act, the NDEA, to really put a premium on science tech uh, programs, et cetera, because we can't let the Russians beat us. Uh, the Soviets cannot be allowed to, to beat the Americans. So launches the space race, JFK plays into we are almost done. The light is at the end of the tunnel. All right. So with Kennedy, you have the Bay of Pigs. This was an Eisenhower op that the CIA was running uh, that Kennedy kind of takes over and uh, is a failed invasion of Cuba. We were going to use Cuban exiles. We're going to put them on Cuba, funded, trained by the American military and the agency. And they would spark a revolt and it would be seen as a Cuban revolt. And we'd overthrow Castro, who had taken over in Cuba. And the Americans would do it, but would not be caught or be seen as the ones doing it. Uh, this is a major failure for the Americans. Um, we kind of get caught with our hand in the cookie jar. And uh, Castro, this, this pushes Castro and the Soviets together even more. Uh, we'll talk about it on the, the next slide coming up here with the missile crisis. 
it was important to the Americans because it was only 97 miles off the coast of Florida. So uh, again, this is uh, kind of the shifting front of the Cold War. And Kennedy uh, is very upset with all of this because uh, the CIA pretty much lied to him about the Bay of Pigs. You have another crisis in Berlin. Uh, Khrushchev thinks Kennedy is a, a, a young dude that doesn't know any better. And Khrushchev's going to try to bully him. And so they build the Berlin Wall. Uh, we don't stop the construction of the wall. And uh, the wall becomes kind of the, the go-to uh, image uh, for the divide in the Cold War. Sets up Reagan years later. Mr. Gorbachev tear down his wall. Kennedy goes to Berlin as well. Berlin is always seen as like the city in the Cold War. Uh, and he gives his speech where he famously says, Ich bin ein Berliner, which is I am a Berliner, saying the world is with you, basically. Um, and there's a joke about like he mispronounced the German and said like, I am a jelly donut. Funny, yeah, if that happens. All right, so here we see the Cuban invasion, uh, the failed invasion of it, right? We'd come from the Virgin Islands from, from the south because it can't be seen to be American. Uh, the problem we run into the place they hit, it's a big swampy, boggy area, and Castro was vacationing there, our bad. And so a huge chunk of the army was with him. The invasion fails. Kennedy doesn't commit any American air power, which is what was needed uh, to make that successful. Kennedy doesn't do that. And everybody, it's clearly seen that the Americans tried this and failed, and we look silly, and uh, it embarrasses us. It looks bad. Here we have an image of the Berlin Wall. Um, on the west, it's all full of graffiti. On the east side uh, is where the guard towers are, uh, and they'd shoot you if you try to come across. Uh, so it really becomes that visual of, of people desiring freedom and the hurdles it takes to achieve that. Uh, economic prosperity, freedom, just safety. Um, east Germany was not a fun place to be, and the wall really begins to signify that. All right, so now we move to the missile crisis. Here we find out that the Russians are sending ballistic missiles to Cuba. And if had they become operational, it would have been a major threat to American security. Uh, it was estimated as a flight time from Cuba to D.C. of seven minutes, uh, which doesn't give you any time to evacuate any cities or anything like that. Uh, they could hit pretty much every part of the country, but like the northwest chunk of Washington state. See it in the top right, reconnaissance aircraft sees it. Uh, JFK orders a blockade, but a blockade is an act of war. So we call it a quarantine. Uh, and basically we put warships around Cuba and we say nobody gets in there out of Cuba. Uh, the Russians are sending nukes there. Um, this is one of the moments where we come very close to nuclear war. Um, Khrushchev and communicating with Kennedy talked about like uh, they're trying to untie a knot by pulling on both ends of a string, which only makes the knot tighter. Uh, stores get stripped of all goods. Like they really, I mean, it very comes very, very close to, uh, to launching nukes at one another. But ultimately, a deal is struck in secret. Khrushchev agrees to remove the missiles from Cuba, and the Americans promise that we will not invade Cuba and we will remove our own missiles from Turkey over the next six months to a year. They also create a hotline, the famous kind of red phone. You pick it up, it rings instantly, uh, and it will allow the two leaders to, to talk directly, which hadn't really existed before. And so th this is an important uh, jump. Kennedy will also sign the nuclear test ban treaty where uh, we ban atmospheric testing, so no more testing the nukes in uh, the open air, right? Blowing them up in the South Pacific, stuff like that. So that's a step, right, in, in trying to ease tensions that had come very, very close to being very destructive uh, with the Cuban Missile Crisis. So now we're, we're edging towards Vietnam. Right? We, we reject New Look. We talked about in favor of flexible response. Um, the dominoes in Southeast Asia, you need to be able to respond to those dominoes individually. So Kennedy uh, will create the Green Berets. These guys are special forces dudes that are, are very good at uh, insurgent warfare. Uh, they basically um, go into a country in small numbers and will train native forces uh, to be combat forces. Uh, Counterinsurgency, we use them in, against the war on terror uh, today. Uh, these guys are some bad dudes. Uh, they go in as, uh, as advisors, ultimately to Vietnam is where we're leading to. Um, so it's a trade-off, right? We're putting boots on the ground in countries now, but it also, you know, is maybe walking us back from from launching nukes. 
which is ultimately a good thing. So this will really be seen in Vietnam. You've got a uh, you know, trying to stop the dominoes from falling uh, now. So the Viet Minh, right, those have been Ho Chi Minh's guys against the French. Uh, you've got, now you've got the Viet Cong. These are South Vietnamese uh, citizens that are going to fight against the Diem regime. So uh, the American military will call them VC or Victor Charlie. Uh, so if you've watched the Vietnam movies or anything, you might see the soldiers referring to the, to the guys as Charlie. Uh, that's military slang. For, for these guys. These are, are not soldiers. They're kind of an insurgent force in addition to the North Vietnamese Army, which will fight as well. We talked about MACVs being set up or Max being set up. MACV is Vietnam. We jacked the number of advisors up. Strategic Hamlet is not going to be very successful. Uh, we start trying to, you know, move people around the country from their villages to because we want to like win the hearts and minds and protect the civilian populations by disrupting them. Uh, advisors are increasingly being pulled into combat ops, uh, and, and we're, we're stumbling towards a, a full-on conflict in Vietnam, uh, which is not good. So you have, uh, moving into 63, you've got the, the Diem regime really getting pushed back against uh, in Vietnam. Uh, the Buddhist monks in the top right, that's a very famous picture, it was on Time Magazine's cover. Um, sets himself on fire in a, in a protesting suicide move. Uh, and, and you can see the graphic imagery there. Uh, in response, the DiEM regime starts pushing a lot of uh, oppressive policies. Um, South Vietnam's military is going to overthrow DiEM. Kennedy's made aware of this. He green lights it. He tells him, hey, don't, don't kill him. And then uh, they kill him anyway. And graphically, you see in the bottom right. And then just a week later, the, the president himself is assassinated in Dallas. Uh, and, and that's going to usher in Johnson and, uh, Vietnam begins to get more and more destabilized and Johnson will, will push ultimately for a greater military, uh, presence there and Vietnam will start and we'll tackle that in the 1960s. So this brings it into the chapter. Thankfully, I appreciate you guys for hanging tough through all of this. Uh, feel free. If you have any questions, always email me, uh, anything like that, but, but hopefully this helps get you ca uh, caught up on the Cold War in the 1950s.